So we have Abraham. And here in the South, one of the things that was interesting when we, Tara and I moved here, I was doing a lot of data research um, just 10 years ago. Actually, um, June the 9th, um, which is this week, just here in a few days, will mark 10 years since we met in our home for the very first time with nine people. 10 years since we, we sat there and just prayed, come Holy Spirit. We broke bread for the first time as a body here in just a couple of days. So on the 9th, I just want you uh, to remember that. Um, but here in the South, one of the things that struck me was this statistics, uh, they, they make all these lists of like towns like Jacksonville right now is like, like the second highest like real estate market that's just growing. You've seen some of those lists. Well, I saw two of them. One, that Jacksonville showed up on the most religious cities, top 50 uh, in America. Um, and then like not even like a day or two later, I saw Jacksonville shows up on the most irreligious cities too. <laughs> and I was like, that seems strange. That seems odd. But then I lived here for a little bit, and I got it. I understand why it shows up on both, because there's a lot of cultural Christianity. There's a lot of people who claim they have a church home. There's a lot of people who, uh, you know, Christian is on their Facebook profile. If anyone asked them, they would say Christian, but if we get really into the roots of their life, they're pretty irreligious, and that there's not much fruit that goes with their repentance. That's the real talk of the culture of our city when it comes to spirituality. And there's a lot of reasons for that. We'll unpack those in a series later this year, okay? We're, we're prepping it. Um, but let, let's continue. I, because some of us, we're actually in the same place. And, and we say, you know, we, we won't say Abraham's my father, but say, no, I, I go to church. Like, I'm a, I'm a good person. I don't do bad things. I try to give every once in a while. I try to Try to be good to people. We're not saying this. But then he says in verse 9, The axe is ready, already at the root of the trees. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. You, you know what fire that is, right? He's talking about son of the devil, and he's talking about hell here. <laughs> thrown in the fire. Not the fire of the Holy Spirit. He'll talk about that here in a minute. This is the fire of hell. He's saying, hey, this is serious. This is serious. You can't live under cultural Christianity. You can't live under this kind of umbrella, but there's no real movement to your heart. And so the people respond. As we should respond, what should we do then? What, what happened in Acts chapter 2? Taryn just read it. They said, well, what, should we, what should we do? This is people who are saying, okay, we get it. Like, there, there's some things that need to be changed or transitioned in my life. What should we do then? And, and this is what the crowd is asking John the Baptist, and he answers them. And, and what, what he says is kind of a little bit different than what we might think. He says, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. Wait a second. Do what? And anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you're required to. He told them, be honest. Live and, and do your job with integrity. Verse 14, the soldiers came and asked. There's people from all walks of life coming to him. And, and the two that, that, that Luke highlights here from the crowds, maybe there was more people who are coming, like, what should I do in keeping to bear you know, uh, fruit in keeping with my repentance? Probably from all different walks of life. And it's interesting that Luke highlights tax collectors people who are really like hated in society, people who they, they just kind of think they're pretty sleazy overall, um, and, then, and then soldiers who come. And again, there was a rough uh, relationship with the Roman Empire here, and soldiers are not people, it's like favorite people. There's an intimidation factor, and, and he points to what's going on in their line of work, in, in their life. What should we do? Don't extort money, and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. So we see all these ideals, we see generosity, we see living on less than what you actually think you might need. If you've got two shirts, give one away. We see this spirit of generosity, of fairness, of honesty and integrity in our life. It's what, what we do in our work life should correspond to, to who we say we are as children of Abraham, as God's children, as sons and daughters of the living God. They're in, in keeping with that repentance. So yes, yes, are we going to make mistakes? Of course we are. Are we going to fall short? Of course we are. And God's grace covers that. We're not to live in shame. But the Holy Spirit has come to transform and guide us 
and to prune those things in our lives that need to be pruned so that we may bear more fruit, more good fruit, as, John, as Jesus says in John 15. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. I love this. It's a, it's a picture of where the people of Israel are. They've been waiting for hundreds of years for the Messiah to show up, and they're wondering, is this the guy? He seems a little bit different. <laughs> Maybe this is the Messiah. And John answers them as, in this beautiful way. I baptize you with water, but one who's, um, who is more powerful than I will come the straps of whose sandals I am unworthy to untie, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. This is the first New Testament prophecy of what they've been waiting for from Joel chapter 2, uh, and then what we see lived out in Acts chapter 2. And I love uh, John's heart of humility here, as the people are wanting to crown him Messiah. He could have been like, well, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm not exactly him but I'm the guy who's going to like usher it in. I'm like his forerunner. I'm like going to go through the wall and make things easier for him. He could have done all that. He said, no, 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 no. He's like, I'm not even worthy to tie sandals. It's not about me. It's not about me. There's this humility in his life that we should model, frankly, and, and as we decrease, as, a, as we become more humble and we make our life more and more about Jesus Christ, who's given us great purpose and it's for his renown, he rounds it out, and we'll close out, and we'll talk here for a few minutes. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheats into his barn. He will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to him. He was using a lot of strong language. Some of us, we need strong language to wake us up. Not, not curse words, not abusive words, but strong language so that it gets into our heart. But never forget, it's good news. Even some days when the scripture cuts bone and marrow and just rips us open into our heart, it's not a pastor getting on you, knowing every detail about your life. It's the Holy Spirit convicting you of sin and calling us to repentance so that we may be filled with his spirit more and more. You thankful for God's word today? I'm thankful. We see all these ideas of generosity and, and honesty and contentment here in the scripture that are the fruit of repentance. And as we're wrapping up the series here on Pentecost Sunday, I thought it would be helpful to get real practical um, with us and talk about some key practices. Because it's like, oh great, contentment. All right, I'm going to try to be more content. But I want to I narrow it down to four practices, a couple of which we see in this text and a couple that I'm going to draw from other places in scripture from it. And I think we see that it's, it's a preparation for what God's going to do, that repentance re involves our actions, it, some, some things that are a part of our life and we develop a rhythm with. And frankly, all of these are hard, but they're good. And so I want to dive right into those today. Uh, first, I think we see right here in this text uh, to live simply, uh, a life of simplicity, I would say. These are four practices that shape contentment. One is simplicity. I remember um, for, for many years, my eye and like design-wise, I'm really drawn to a very clean, modern aesthetic. It's just what I like. You may notice it by uh, some of our aesthetic around here. And um, I, I just, I like it. I don't want it to feel like a museum, but I really like, clean, like, like a clean slate. I, I kind of am drawn to that. But simplicity is not minimalism. Um, I, I remember reading in, in, uh, in like our first year or two of marriage this book, and uh, I, I ended up writing these four words um, on a sticky note, and I sat them in front of my desk um, for, for 10 years, uh, and it says, resist complexity, pursue simplicity. I just put that because I, I just felt like my life was getting more complex. I think we all dream of a world, we dream of a life that's just a little simpler, don't we? You ever feel that about money? You're like, I just wish I didn't have to worry about money. Things were just simpler. How many of, um, I'll just say ladies in the room, fellas, I know many of you probably think of the same thing after a long day at work, uh, but like, how many of you have watched some HGTV where they're kind of living life off the land and you're like, things would just be simpler if I just got a piece of land, All right? You're not calculating raising those chickens and milking cows. You're not calculating all that. We think that hey, it would just be nice for things to be simpler. And so I just, I really embraced in my heart not only 
um, in my own life, but in ministry, that I want to resist the complexity because things just, as they evolve, they get more complex. Your business gets more complex. Your systems get more complex. It gets more complex as we buy more things. As we, as we get more things, we actually, uh, we, we think that it's actually going to make things easier. If I get this, then we'll be able to vacation. We'll do this. It actually makes things more complex. I've got more things to take care of now. I got more things I got to gas up now. <laughs> I got more things I got insurance on now. And so, what felt like things were getting easier for us by our acquisition of more, we've made things more complex, and we long for this simplicity. And what, we, what do we what do we see John telling him here, in, in telling them in keeping with repentance, is if you have two of something, a shirt, this is kind of tunic vibes, right? Um, if you have two tunics, like. Give one of them away. You don't actually need two of them. Tara and I were joking. She was doing something in her coat closet, putting the jacket up, and she's like, I, I have no idea for how people in Florida have so many jackets. We have so many jackets in this closet. <laughs> one of every color, of every size. When there's five people and there's one closet for coats, there's, right? <laughs> it fills up quickly. Um, but we don't need two. When we have extra food, like we can give it away. A couple of authors, uh, one by the name of Richard Foster and, and, and Mark Scandrett, said simplicity is an inward reality that can be seen in an outward lifestyle of choosing to leverage our time, our money, and talents and possessions towards what matters most. How did Jesus say in, in Matthew chapter 6, or uh, 5 verse 19, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy where thieves break in and, and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Store up treasures for ourselves in, in the things that matter. It's an inward reality that it rolls over into a lifestyle. And so what, what next? Like what, what does it look like for us and how does this shape us? One, I, I want to caution us, more than we realize, we find our identity in our things. When I was in sixth grade, and my family's a blue, blue-collar family, hard-working family, parents did the absolute best. They, I mean, they, my dad worked two or three jobs just to, to be able to take us on vacations and stuff like that. God bless parents who are hustling and taking care of their kids and are just working and doing your best. God, God sees that. Even if your kids don't see it right now, they'll see it one day. They did everything uh, that they could for us. They were so uh, good to, to us. Um, um, and, and I, <clears throat> I, I realize um, that so much of this generation is, um, is, is entitled. And, and I remember as a, a young child, when I would get one of those Tommy Hilfiger shirts, I just felt a little cooler when I walked into school. <laughs> and that big old red, white, and blue and it wasn't just that. It was a lot of things over the years. It was the car I drove, the name brand I wore. Frankly, it was till I fully surrendered my life to Christ that I actually, I, I, I hate to wear labels. I don't like words on my shirt. It just like kind of, Taryn knows it. Like, <laughs> I just, I don't want anything on my, on my shirt. My identity's not in what I wear. It's not in the things I have, but more than we care to admit, we find our identity in the neighborhood we live in, in the cars we drive, the networks that we're a part of, more than we care to admit. And simplicity is saying, I don't need that. And it's an act of repentance that says, God, I'm sorry for putting my identity in things where it should not belong, in stuff, the things of this world. And as we do, as we go with less, a more simple life in our things and our possessions, because let's be real, more possessions does not equal more happiness. It doesn't. The, the, the only people who haven't realized that are people who haven't had it long enough, haven't hit bottom yet and realized it, and they're just getting these temporary things or people have never had it. They, 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 don't, they don't satisfy. And so as we live with less, we actually make more room for the Holy Spirit to in, like fill us in the identity of Christ, to shape us in his identity. Uh, the second um, practice that I think is really important that shapes contentment in our life, because we're not just going to wa- like wake up and say, I lack nothing. It's these practices of our life. So some of we, us need to start cleaning out some closets. Some of us need to start selling some stuff. N- not for anything, because it's going to cut away at that place in our heart that's found our identity in our stuff. 
The second one is, is generosity. It's not just, hey, what I'm doing less with in my life. It's actually I'm giving it to somebody else. I'm blessing someone else through generosity. I was thinking this week about the many ways um, over the years that I've seen uh, generosity be evident in this body. And I'm so proud of you. Uh, for, uh, there's so many things I, I'm just proud, and I, I, I brag on you all the time. I just, I love you so much, uh, Fathom Church. I just, I'm, I'm so grateful to be able to lead you and, and pastor you, and you're such a generous people. You, you really are. I think many of us would admit, hey, we're in the process of growing in this generosity thing. It, it, it's a hard, because it's a hard thing maybe for some of us, um, but I've never met somebody who said, I don't want to be more generous. I've never met somebody like, I like being a Scrooge. I mean, maybe there's, they're out there, but I, I've never met anybody who will admit it to me to my face. I think we all, like we see people who are generous and we're like, oh, it's amazing. We're moved by generosity. Generosity, if we really think about it, has changed all of our lives. For God gave his only son, <laughs> right? He, it's God's generosity. But I was thinking of the many ways I've seen that over the years. I was thinking about times I've seen kids uh, empty, like young kids, empty their piggy bank for building funds and mission trips. I, I think about times in which um, contractors who have walked in and generously donated their uh, labor and materials to make uh, the, the kingdom of God move forward. I, I, I remember back uh, this coming Sunday, it'll be three years since there was a, a couple in the a church who, who came and, and, and gave a car to a single mom who really needed a reliable vehicle. It was a beautiful moment of generosity just flowing in his body. Maybe you were the recipient uh, during the toilet paper shortage. Come on, anybody, receive a little, somebody spared a square for you, <laughs> you know, to survive a couple more weeks through the pandemic. Generosity is, is, is powerful, and it's not just doing with less and living simply, but it's a spirit of generosity. If we look to Acts chapter 2, you know what happens is they're empowered with God's spirit. Not only are they joining together in, in shared community, they're just being ridiculously generous. Because they're no longer holding it like this. They're like, God, if you can make this happen, like your spirit is so real and so rich in us, watch this. Watch this. And we've just been just pursuing this mantra of God, do your thing. Do your thing, and when we're generous, we give God an opportunity. Just do your thing. God bless these people. And, and, and what, what happens is it's shaping contentment in our life. And it's an act of repentance once again to say, God, I don't, I'm sorry for making it about me. It's, God, I, I want to become less. I want to decrease so that you may increase. I, I think generous people, three things. One, they see the need, they feel a need, and they meet the need. Some of us, we're not meeting needs, because we're not seeing needs. Some of us, we're seeing them, but we haven't yet felt them. And oftentimes, feeling them is, is it, like, that's empathy. It, it's being able to feel it, not just compassion. Hey, I, feel, I see the need. Oh, I'm sorry for you. It's moving into what I call divine empathy, which God himself embodied when Jesus Christ came and felt the human experience, everything we've ever felt in our life. He's felt it thoroughly. And so when we live in that way, then we go to the place where we can meet the need. I, I love this, this psalm in Psalm 131 too. It says, I've calmed and I've quieted myself. Remember what Psalm 23 says? Like, he leads me beside quiet waters. But I love this. Like, God, you've taught me in some of those quiet waters moment. I know how to calm myself now quiet myself. I'm like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I'm content. I'm content. I, I pray that as we find opportunities to be generous, as we see needs, as we feel the needs, we meet those needs, and there's something happening. Every single time we do, it's an act of repentance saying, God, I'm content. I, I lack nothing. God, I have all that I need. I'm amply supplied. Every time we're generous, we say, I'm amply supplied. And I'm not in a scarcity mindset. I'm in an abundant mi mindset because here's the, here's the core verse in our life of generosity and stewardship. is Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. That includes you and me. All, the earth and all who live in it. You and me. Everything around. He, it's all his. And so we're simply stewards to do with God's money, what God wants to do for his glory. 
And so be generous. In fact, I know so many of you, you're feeling the strapped, that gas prices is hitting you hard. And so we're going to do a stewardship series later uh, this summer that's going to help. We're going to talk budgeting and just really try to resource you and just help you be confident in this season and free and not stressing out. And like, because it's like, we can do it for a little bit, but after a while, right, it starts, it starts adding up. So let's go to third practice and, and we're going to uh, wrap up here. Third one that, that we don't see particularly in this text, but I think it's huge that we found in our life is gratitude. Gratitude. Uh, not long ago, Lee um, shared uh, from the stage uh, that gratitude and a kind of complaining um, can't really live in the same space. Like it, when we're grateful, when we're practicing Thanksgiving, oh, they, they, just, they just can't operate in the same space. Like mentally, like neurologically, it can't operate in the same space. And, and, and I found that gratitude has this massive power in our life. I remember reading a study and it really shaped a lot of our meetings and how we do meetings and team time, that we start everything with a time of thanksgiving and a time of gratitude, a time of, uh, of reflecting on how we see God working in our life. We call it wins, but it's wins of God's kingdom. What is God doing? It's an opportunity for us to slow down and say, God, I see what you're doing here in the midst of a, maybe even a dry season, a season where there's been a lot of complaining. I'm telling you, I don't know about your home, but Taryn and I looked at each other less than a month ago, and we said, there's a lot of complaining in this house. It was us, it was our kids, it was, it was all of us, and we're like, we, we, gotta, we gotta back up here and get back to gratitude, because in, when, when there's a lot of things going wrong in the world, we'll find ourselves in a state of complaining, and we can't be in a state of complaining and a state of contentment at the same time. But gratitude is what begins to fuel contentment in our life. I love what Psalm 104 says. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and court in his courts with praise. And give thanks to him and praise his name. Enter in. Wake up in the morning. His presence is there with us and thank God. At the dinner table, thank God for his goodness. At the bed, at, when you're at your kid's bedside, say thanks for what God's doing. When you're getting together, like just be a person whose eyes are not just turning to the needs, but they're turning to gratitude for all that God has done. Because as we do that, as there's a less complaining, more gratitude, his, the Holy Spirit's just, we can feel it. It changes our life. It transforms us to be people who are not just content with what we have, but we know that all that we have doesn't even pale in comparison to what we have in God himself. Contentment in God. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. It's not because, hey, I've got all these things. All this is met. All these boxes are checked off on what I think I need in my entitlement box. I've got the right phone, got the right job, I've got the right position, therefore I lack nothing. No, no, the Lord's my shepherd, so I lack nothing. I have him less complaining, more gratitude, and he fills us. His Holy Spirit abides ever present in us. And the final thing today is, um, actually, uh, you can throw up that quote there, someone might, might appreciate it. Um, uh, gratitude fuels contentment and extinguishes entitlement. We have a huge entitlement culture, and I believe it really begins to just cut that at the roots. Uh, and the final practice that I want to talk about today is the practice of Sabbath. John doesn't explicitly talk about it here, but as a person who's been deeply transformed by this practice, I, I, I want to tell you today um, how deeply some of us, we need to stop and rest it's probably helpful for some of you that don't know my story. For those of you that do, um, and you're annoyed by me talking about Sabbath one more time, um, don't be. Really consider how God might be speaking to you through this. But I'm a recovering workaholic. I, I spent ungodly hours working for God. And some of us, we're working ungodly hours for ourselves. <laughs> Some of us are working ungodly hours for whatever the next thing is, treasures of this earth. And we're avoiding this principle of the Sabbath to which God commits in the Ten Commandments more square footage than any other commandment. He modeled it in creation. He, 
He provides for Sabbath. See the Exodus 16 and 17 with the story of man and quail. He told him to shut it down for one day to stop. Sabbath is, is stopping 24 hours in your week. Power down. No paid work, no unpaid work. And it's not to, to check off another religious box. If you do that, you, you're missing it. And just like, just go to the beach, do like whatever. You're missing it. It's not just another box to do. It's a practice that shapes our heart and our life. As we set that side of time and we don't fill it back up with more laundry and, and our to-do lists and our grocery shopping and all the things that we can do and want to do, as we do that, what we do is we, we stop. We contemplate God's goodness. We, we, we contemplate God's faithfulness. We, we find our identity not in what we do and what we can get done, what we do or what we get done, but we find our identity in the God who loves us, who is our provider, who cares for us. If he clothes the lilies of the field, how much more? If God, if your fathers on earth know how to give good gifts, how much more can your Father in heaven give good gifts? It's repenting. It's cutting away this thing in our heart that says, I got this. I keep building. I've, I've written many definitions or many quotes around Sabbath, I've written a lot on it. Um, but here's one that God just spoke just in a moment, and I want to share it with you. Sabbath is a relentless attack on our selfish ambitions, our vain desires, and our insatiable quest for more. Through it, our soul finds ultimate rest in God who created it for us and us for him. And some of us, your soul hasn't had rest in a while because you haven't stopped. You've been finding your identity in your work. You've been finding it in your stuff, your hobbies and your job. All kinds of good stuff, but not God's stuff. And what Colossians tells us is not to let anybody judge us by what else we eat or drink or, or with regard to a religious festival, talking about the Jewish festivals, or new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day even. But here's what he says, Paul says, to the church at Colossae. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. It's a picture. It's a shadow that points us to our ultimate rest in Jesus Christ. And so if you're in the process of figuring out what does it look like to rest, what does it look like to shut it down, hey, start practicing it. Start practicing. Find joy. Find celebration in a God who tells you to take the day off. I've got you covered. I can do more with your less. I can do more. And as we do, Here's the best part of Sabbath. It's the Holy Spirit fills us. Holy Spirit, it's just like a reset button every single week when I, my, my flesh, my desires, my ambitions, my quest for more gets out of control. You know what? Sabbath comes. And it's a reminder that it was made. God gave it, gave it to us as a gift. And he's given us the gift of himself that we are made for him and, and he for us. That we're called to long for him. So I don't know where you're at in your life. I don't know what your story is right now, but I know every single one of these practices are acts of repentance, turning away from the ways in which we've found our identity and our stuff and all the things that we've talked about. Produce fruit, bear fruit in keeping with the repentance. So I just want to ask you, just right where you're at, just bow your head for just a moment. And I want you to just to picture yourself for a moment coming to be baptized. If you've never been baptized, get signed up today. Use that connect card in your back seat. <laughs> the back your seat back. I want you to imagine you're about to be baptized by John. You're coming to him like a tax collector, a soldier, or whatever your line of profession is, a domestic engineer, whatever your journey is, coming to him and say, what must I do? What do I need to do? 
And now I want you to turn the focus. It's not about John. We're listening to the Holy Spirit today. Say, Holy Spirit, what do I need to do to bear fruit in keeping with the repentance that I have? Will you just think about that for just a moment? Just let the Holy Spirit speak to you right now. Maybe you just whisper in your heart or in your head, Holy Spirit, I'm listening, whatever you want to say. What must I do, Lord? God, right now, I pray for every single person in the sound of my voice. God, as we are moving towards you, away from our desires of the things of this world, our vain ambitions, our relentless pursuit and quest for more, God, may we find contentment in everything we need in who you are and your spirit that is ever abiding in us today. At all times, you are present with us. God, I pray today as we begin to practice these habits, these actions, these practices, would you come and fill us? The space left, God, in our budget, would you do more, God, that that your glory may be shown. God, every moment that we're generous to somebody, would you use that for the glory of your kingdom? God, when we shut it down and we commit it to you and our brain wants to keep going and our bodies want to keep going and and we're like, we don't know how to do this. God, Holy Spirit, would you guide us? Like the psalmist said, to those quiet waters, those green pastures, to find all that we need in you and in you alone. God, and as we do, as we arise from our Sabbath, may we serve in your kingdom as confident people filled with your spirit, empowered by your spirit to preach the good news in humility just as John the Baptist did. We love you today. In Jesus' holy name, amen. I'm gonna ask you to stand. This band's gonna lead us. We've got prayer partners here. Let's respond to God by just telling him how good he is. That's what we're going to sing. They're going to lead us in this song. Everybody put a smile on your face. God's good. This is good news. So lead us, band. Let's, let's worship God and thank him for his goodness today.